Hi. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Hey, how's it going? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. I'm good. How are you finding quarantine? It's a bit mad, to be honest. Um, mm. When it, when it first all kicked off, I had a little bit of a panic because I thought, oh no, my whole routine's going to change. Everything's going to be a nightmare. But um, actually, no, I've, I've kind of stuck to a routine and I found that that's helped me quite a lot. So yeah, no, it's, it's okay. But just missing sparring a lot, to be honest. And, I was exactly the same. I was like, what am I going to do? How am I going to deal with this? And for the first couple of days, I was like, you know, I'm just going to take the break and it'll be fine. And then panic set in as well. And it was structure, getting up at a, like the same time every day, getting my stuff together, having work to do exercising Absolutely. makes it a bit better so thank you very much for taking the time i'm uh, uh delighted that you're able to come on tonight oh thanks very much for having me you know it's, it's great for you to ask me thank you well of course scott is scotland's <laughs> first world champion of course history maker i was um when i knew you were coming on i just kind of like revisited like some of your fights and some of your old interviews and stuff like that. It must be an incredible feeling to know that your your name is associated with a piece of history. Oh my God, yeah. I mean, I must admit that night was the most stressful night of my life. I felt like the, the whole weight of my country was on my shoulders. <laughs> but yeah, no, super proud. And um, yes, yeah, someone said to me after it, you've, you've nailed it, Hannah. You're the answer to a pub quiz question now. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's when you really know you've made it when you when you pop up on the quiz at christmas or in quarantine because there's quizzes all over the place happening at the moment absolutely but can, yeah. we, can we talk about that time hannah because like i mean it's 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 an amazing feat and accolade in any sports to be world best you know not just in boxing talk me through that time period of like you know when you when you get told you get you're getting the opportunity to fight for a world title did things shift? Was there a change? Did did you kind of say, right, now is my time to prove myself and to make history? Yeah, so I'd had a couple of opportunities before that to fight for world titles, but they weren't really in my weight class. I, I stepped up to the 168 pound limit, the super, super middleweight and also the middleweight one. Um, and when this opportunity came around to actually fight in my true weight class, I was like, I've got to grab it with both hands. I've got opportunity to do this at home in my own country, make history um yeah no it was just like I knew that this was my moment this is I was going to do it and I was going to do it for the con my country and for myself and it was the right time so yeah no it was, it was really exciting I imagine and you know when you get to go back home and, and you have the title did you start to notice that the the public or people that you were around that they one started to take a little bit more notice and two a little bit more interest in in kind of your career and you know what you do and what's next absolutely i think 2019 was such a massive year for women in sport in general um i made it into the top 10 uh female athletes of the year of the decade basically uh with the um the herald at home in the paper and i was up there with some people that i look up to as amazing female athletes and mm. it just made me so so proud um, and also, as boxing's kind of, uh, it's one of those sports which is either either you really love it or you're not really into it. And I think, yeah. especially when it comes to women in the sport, for, uh, for combat sports in general, um, I think that it made a real impact when I became world champion because Scotland's such a small country and like it doesn't matter whether you're world champion as a boxer, world champion in in running or world champion in tiddlywinks, Scotland will back you, you know, 100% yeah. because they're just so proud to have people that can like, you know, raise the flag for the country, you know, and make it make us stand out. So yeah, no, I think it made a big difference. And also it meant that I had a lot more young people um, stepping in to kind of be like, looking up to me as a role, role model, especially young girls, which I thought was amazing because, you know, in Scotland, we could definitely do with loads more girls coming into sport. And um, yeah, no, I just felt like, I made a real difference there, you know, made a bit of an impact. So that's good. Absolutely. And, and something that's, you know, a common theme that's sort of ran through all your media and your interviews that you've done is that you've been very outspoken about, you know, the role of, of women in the sport of boxing and, and how it should be, you know, promoted more and how we need younger girls to get involved and that we need to, we're still not on a level where we're equal in terms of pay, in terms of maybe respect as, as we are with men. Um, is that important for you? I mean, do you, do you kind of relish in using your voice in that way when, when you get the opportunity to do interviews? 
Absolutely. I think it w- when you're in this position, like, you know, it gives you that chance to have a voice. I think a lot of people mm-hmm. don't have that voice. And, and I have a, a, a position where I am now where I can actually speak up. People will take note and people will listen. So I think it, it is important for any women, especially in sport boxing, to be like, you know, pushing forward for us to have equality with men um, and also to us to get better pay just in general, because like the pay mm. is just nowhere near what the guys get for the same the same work. And, you know, like we're also pushing to have the same number of rounds and the same length of rounds, you know, because at the moment it's still 10 two minute rounds for a world title. It's 10 two minute rounds for a European title. So it really caps the, the sport so people can't actually advance in different levels like the guys. Mm. They have 12 three minute rounds for a world title. You know, and I would love to fight three minute rounds. <laughs> I think this would be an amazing situation. It would suit my side of fighting so well. And also, I think girls, we're just like exactly the same. We put all the same effort in. We bleed the same, you know, like we should be getting that our worth, you know. And uh, hopefully we're starting to get there, you know, with Matchroom bringing more girls on, especially mm. in the UK and Frank Warren as well. So I think girls are getting more of the, that. That platform is becoming available. Um, I'm signed in America so that that platform is where I am over there as well but I do get to fight back here in the UK which is great Um, and yeah no those when we get more TV time that allows people to see that actually what we can do is just as good as the guys and people can get involved so yeah no it's um it's slowly getting there slowly (laughs) it is it is you know like do you think, I mean, you mentioned Frank Warren, Eddie Hearn, and they have done and they are doing their bit, um, you know, with signing um, females, with, you know, co-maining events or having females as the co-main event in slots and stuff. But do you think that they need to do more? Like, do you think that there's a bit of a responsibility on the leaders in boxing promotion to really kind of look back and say, do you know what? We're giving them the, the platform. We're, we're doing the, this, you know, trying to make it as fair as possible, but it's not enough. We really need to step up our game here and, and, and do more. Yeah, I think, you know, we can always do more. I think promoters in general, like even from the small hall shows right through to up with Matchroom and things like that, you know, like Eddie is definitely doing some great things. You know, obviously having Katie Taylor as a bit of a figurehead there. That was Terry mm-hmm. Harper as well. Um, you know, and he's, putting these girls on at prime time these ladies are on their showcasing and they are on their prime time yes it would be great to have a woman headline the show and all that sort of thing and a bit more often um but it could really start in the small hall shows so it is it's to be understood that in the uk there aren't that many girls fighting there just aren't mm. and so all, most of our opponents have to come from abroad so therefore it costs more for our opponents than it does for the guys the guys, you can phone some guy up from Portsmouth, he'll come up to London and have a fight. You know, you just you have to <laughs> Whereas here, you have to find someone, they're coming over from Hungary, you've got to fly them and their coach to come over. That's immediately going to cost more money, even though the rounds mm. are shorter. So I think promoters have to be aware that this is going to cost them a little bit more until the number of women increases in the UK. And we have more option for female journey women, for example. Um, yeah. So they have to be supportive of that. And then, you know, and have more girls um showcasing on their fights like um goodwin shows they've got more f- females now and he's been a great supporter of women in in the sport right from the beginning so you know he has more girls on the show it's quite a regular fixture these days so people are getting kind of more used to it for sure i know it's a great thing when you talk about opponents and um you know uh being matched for fights and stuff is it true that you had you know quite a difficult time being matched and that you've had situations where you know it's fight day and people haven't turned up yeah so like it's it's very difficult I think especially at my weight class so obviously from like 154 pounds 160 you know when you're going up the weights there just isn't that that many of us in comparison to the guys Mm -hmm. for example Um, so when you're trying to find opponents you need to make sure that you know you're looking for people around your weight class but then also they've got to be of the same sort of ability and the British Boxing Board of Control they're one of the safest uh, boxing boards in the world but um, it does mean they're really strict with who they allow you to fight you could you can't just mm. have anybody um, and actually my sort of situation started out at my debut because when I had my debut coming up there was like three or four like pull outs things happened things just didn't come to, to fruition um, 
I couldn't get this person sanctioned. I couldn't go with this person. Um, so it was really frustrating. So by the time I actually fought, I said yes to fighting the European number seven at the time, which is probably not someone you want to take on your <laughs> debut. But by that point, I was raging. I was just like, I'm so ready to fight. Please get me anybody. I don't care who it is, you know. But since that point, it has meant that my opponents have had to be of a certain caliber because I haven't fought below that sort of level. Um, and yeah, it does mean that I've been abroad and I fought some of the top level females in the world. Um, but that's also because I'll take a fight anywhere. It doesn't really matter. Mm. And I don't care who it is. Um, so yeah, but it can, it can caveat into who I could actually have as an opponent, which made it doubly difficult. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, do you recognize that boxing fans recognize that in you that you've never shied away from a tough opponent you've never shied away from a challenge and that you know on the right night you can deliver yeah no like I, I didn't come into the sport from having a, a massive amateur background I didn't go I wasn't an amateur boxer at all I came from the white collar background and mm. so like when I came into it I didn't come into it with like high expectations of myself I didn't come in to have a, a completely clean record and finish however many and oh that wasn't my goal my goal was to come in and see how far I could actually take myself in this sport with a lot of dedication and hard work and obsession, really, of, in improving yeah. myself and bettering myself. Um, and, you know, I did it. I, made, I became world champion and I know I belong at that level um, and I'm completely focused on, on being at that level. Um, but when it comes to opponents, everybody out there knows, I, you know, I'll take anybody, I'll fight anybody. It doesn't bother me. And I think, you know, more fighters should be willing to do that you should be more willing to put yourself out there and, and take a challenge because you can you learn from um you know challenges and even from losses you, you to learn great things like when i fought yeah. clarissa that was a fantastic experience i i fought one of the greatest female fighters ever mm. and th th when i look back on that when i'm retired i will be really grateful that i i actually had that experience but it's also set me up massively for loads of fights that i've had since then um, and even the, just the whole experience and I just got better and better and every time I have a more difficult opponent I learn from that situation I grow and develop as a fighter mm. so then I'm a completely different fighter when I get in for the next fight so yeah no I'm, I'm happy to fight anyone did you notice a shift in you know um fans social media followers people taking a little bit more notice when you fought Clarissa Shields because it's such a huge name. And I think with her name, there is, you know, she, it's, she's almost like fears, you know, like fans are like, oh, who, who's going to fight her next? You know, she's so dangerous. And there's, there's a <laughs> lot of good, good energy, you know, when a fight gets announced with Clarissa, Clarissa Shields. Um, did you notice a little shift yourself when you were a match with her? Absolutely. You know, like at the time, um, she was meant to be fighting someone, one of my sparring partners, uh, Christina Hamer. We were quite good friends at the time, and uh, she was meant to be um, fighting her, but then she pulled out with it. Uh, she was sick for some reason. So, like, they couldn't get an opponent. And I, I was like, why, why is no one taking this fight? This is a massive opportunity, an absolutely huge stage. And I was like, I'm here. I'll take it. <laughs> and, um, yeah, like, I, I just couldn't understand why people didn't want to push themselves and, and give themselves the opportunity to become great. So I was like, I'll take it. And I took, I took it and, you know, I, I noticed a lot more people started paying attention. You know, they wanted to see how, what I was going to do, who I was going to, like, what, what I was going to do in the fight, um, how I dealt with the pressure, how I dealt with Carissa's sort of like uh, on um, media days, you know. Yeah. In the lead up to that fight, we were completely like, we, we did not like each other. Chalk and cheese. There was, there was nothing. <laughs> there was no likeness going on there. Um, and actually... <laughs> we had an amazing fight it was it was really good and from that fight I just felt that my sort of reputation was built and I, mm. I showed, showcased some great ability and skills and since then I've just grown and people have been following my journey since then as well um so yeah it was it was a great experience what are some of the positives from it I mean obviously not getting the win is is a massive factor but the, the, would you be the type of person that even with a loss you can take some positives from the situation Absolutely, but I'm not going to say I'm like a saint and when I come out of a fight, I'm totally happy when I, even if I've got a loss, I'm not. I was throwing stuff yes. around, I was mad, you know, I was, I was not happy. Um, but, you know, like, 
you you live and learn and like the next day mm. is always the day when you look back and actually for me it was right after the fight me and Carissa had to go and do anti-doping and we were just chatting and there was a lot of respect between the two of us and I think I gave her a, like a really good fight and in comparison to some some of our other opponents and people were quite surprised um judging mm. from my background I, I don't have any Olympic experience I haven't got gold medals I, you know none of that so you know, I think I showcased some real great skills at that at that fight. And um, we had a great chat afterwards. There was lots of respect. And yeah, no, I took some really good things from it. The whole experience itself as well. Absolutely. Like you mentioned, you know, not having um, a big amateur career. In boxing in particular, it's... Um most people will come from an amateur background and that they would have started at a very young age and they've gone through the ranks. And then when they can't take amateur any further, they'll turn pro. Um, for you, obviously, coming from White Collar, um, I had uh, Fabio Wardley on the other night for an interview. Yeah. And he obviously came from White Collar as well. And, you know, yeah. one of the things that we spoke about was that does White Collar boxing need to get a certain level of more respect? Because I think people's uh, preconception of it is that, you know, it's some guy on the couch with a can of beer and he's like, I'm going to take a fight in six weeks. Sign me up to White Collar, you know. So, you know, what, what was your experience of it? So... I think th there's two ways of looking at it. If, if I was to give anybody any sort of advice who wanted to go into a boxing career, my advice would be join an amateur boxing club because it will stand you in amazingly good stead. You, your, like, your fundamentals will be really worked on and, and that's something mm. that you need in this sport. I mean, for me, I've had to work on, I've been like a work in progress my whole career because I've been catching up on stuff that people have done when they were like 10, 11, 12. I, I, I was yeah. picking it up when I was 23, you know, so... I would say to people, if you want a boxing career, you, you must go and join an amateur club because they will set you up. However, I will also say when it comes to white collar boxing, there are levels to it. Like there are levels to anything. So you have your person that sat on the couch and done an, an eight week camp and they got back <laughs> and that was the yeah. end of it. <laughs> but um, they also have like my, myself, I really enjoyed it and I was doing it to raise money for charities at the time. And um, I, I found it really addictive and I, I I'm quite a, an obsessive person. So like I put all the practice mm. in and all the work and my coach pushed me and, you know, there was different levels. We had some really good fights when I was fighting um, and it wasn't just scraps, you know, we were actually, there was technical boxing involved there. Um, and I think a lot of people don't realize that there are regular fighters on the white collar circuit. So when you get to a certain yeah. point, you, you're fighting people who are quite experienced and people who are actually pretty good, um, but they're just not, they're not an amateur boxer or a professional boxer, so they're not taken very seriously. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, you do get to that sort of level. I, I, my last fight, I think, I, well, second, our third last fight, went to walk out, the girl just didn't turn up. <laughs> she just wasn't there. Um, so yeah, you know, like, but it's a, it's a really good sort of insight into the sport for people who have yeah. never watched boxing. Um, a lot of my family at that point had never seen any boxing. A lot of my friends, all musicians at the time. Um, so coming to watch me box at a white collar event was kind of like a, a dry run for them before they actually came to watch me in a real fight, you know, like for mm. professional boxing. So it was a, it was a nice little inlet for the, the general public, I suppose. I definitely agree with you. And that's actually a topic that's... Um... I think about quite a bit in that how many, not just women, but how many people are there out there that would really enjoy a fight night, but don't know people that they can go with or think that yeah. they have to be like a, 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 like a diehard fan of the sport to go to an event. You know, yeah. especially I cover a lot of regional shows and it's all the fighters are still selling their tickets. It's fight day. They're like at the front door selling tickets and they're on social media and they're trying to like train for a fight, but also they're trying to sell a fight. And yeah. there's just all this stuff going on. And he, like, the question is always like, how do we get the regular public or the people who might enjoy a fight night to take that chance to buy a ticket and to go if they don't know someone fighting on the show? Exactly. So like when I was doing my white collar things, obviously um, it's, White Collar allows you to say that obviously you're, you're doing it to raise money for a charity. Yeah. So therefore people want to help support you raise money for that charity, which is why it's quite easy to get your, your, your workmates to come along. And also yeah. I always say to people, it's like a night out, you know, you're going to have a few beers, you have a great time. You're going to watch me in the ring for three minutes, hopefully beating the person in front of me, yeah. you know, but um, when it comes to professional boxing, it is really, really hard because like when you're selling tickets, it's, 
it's great if you grew up boxing and your whole family and, and you grew up in one area and you like your town support you that's amazing because those people will come with you from the amateurs right through to the pros and they will support you but like if you're like me and you come from a family that isn't a sporting family at all and um you weren't doing this until you're like 23 <laughs> um it's very hard to like teach people what the cost of the tickets going towards i think mm. sometimes people think that that 40 quid or that 60 quid is going in your pocket and actually that's not the case um it's going towards paying for your opponent it's going towards the house it, it's going towards your trainer your manager and then maybe just maybe <laughs> you might make some money maybe <laughs> <laughs> there's a big there's a big maybe there <laughs> absolutely um and the hard thing as well is that people like they don't realize that if you don't sell enough tickets, you can't actually compete. Mm. Uh, and that's a concept that people do not understand. So if you look at any other sport like running or cycling or anything like that, it, you don't have to sell a certain amount of tickets. So yeah, no, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's a very, it's a really whole different world to the rest of the sporting world, I think, to be honest. Absolutely. It definitely is. I, I, before um, we wrap up, I just wanted to talk to you about um, the, the musician side of you that that's, yes. you spoke about as well, you know, and that your family are, are all coming from musicians. And I was so intrigued to hear that you still like teach and that's kind of how you like, you know, bring in a little bit of extra cash and stuff outside of boxing. Um, are you, is that still what you do? Are you still teaching them? Yeah. Um, is it the bassoon? Is that what you play? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very so, cool. um, uh, yeah, no, like actually since this lockdown thing, I've had to set up like my online lessons for music. So I teach flute and the bassoon online as well as music theory. Um, these are things that I like supplement my income with to help pay for the boxing, basically, because yeah. I don't know many other female boxers, especially in the UK, who can afford to just be a full time uh, boxer. They just it's really difficult unless you've got full sponsorship. And, that, and that's really rare. So um, also, I love my music career. Like I, I play with the professional, like I play with professional orchestras. I freelance with orchestras in and around London. Um, I have a wind quintet. And we go and play in care homes and in schools for wow. live music now. So it's really great to give back. And I will always love music. It's like my first love. Um, people always say, oh, you're going to give it up to do the boxing. And the boxing such a short career. Um, I always want to be able to have the opportunity to go back to music, uh, mm. should I wish to. Um, but I really enjoy it. And um, it's it's always going to be part of me so I think like you know I'm not going to give it up but um whilst I'm focusing on my boxing it takes second place at the moment absolutely and would you agree that it's important for fighters especially young fighters to have not necessarily a plan b because I think a lot of fighters get terrified by that kind of having a plan b that it means that yeah. it's taking away from their plan a but I mean to be sensible you know is do you think it's important that you do have an option should the time come when when boxing is not a reality anymore yeah i think it's really important to use your boxing career as an opportunity to build up whatever things you want to do after that because it is being any sort of sports person is a short lived career so like mm. at the moment i'm building up my sort of um sort of I don't know portfolio so I do my music stuff but then I also do things like I do talks in big companies um, and how to build confidence and building resilience and that sort of thing and um, also as a that's being a boxer has allowed me to do that sort of thing so I think it is important for boxers because our career is short and it could stop at any time and a lot of people have really struggled and I, I know mm. for one when I'm when I retire from boxing I want to retire with the thought that I did everything I possibly could because I don't want to be left with that feeling like I still miss, like I'm going to miss it even worse than I'm already going to miss it. You know, yes. so I think it, yeah. it is important to have something, something else in the background that you just like ticking over as an idea. It's not going to take away from your boxing, but it is an option that's something that you can think about for the future. Well, you know, I'm glad to hear you say that you do talking and like um, public speaking and things like that, because it's one thing that's always struck me when I have heard you speak in interviews is that you'd be so good in, in a media capacity, whether it's commentating or whether it's like, you know, being a representative for women in, in boxing or just the sport in general. So that's, I love commentating. Uh, personally, I yeah, that's, that's uh, an area like I see it. I was like, you know, it's, <laughs> Thank you. because you obviously have the experience and you speak very well and, you know, it's, it's, it just it make a lot of sense. It took, it took me a really long time to get to that sort of situation, actually. I, I come from, in, in music, I had 
so really bad performance anxiety and actually it was wow. boxing that helped me get over that performance anxiety so um it helped me build confidence in myself and allow me to stand up there and speak in front of people and perform better in front of people as a soloist um so I have a lot to thank boxing for to be honest um yeah but it's what I talk about in my talks I'm like actually you know it, it really imp- increased my confidence as a in a per- as a person you know um so yeah no I'm I would love to go into commentary it's something that I'd love to do I've done some stuff for Box Nation before um for fight actually for Carissa and uh, Christina Hamer's fight that was one I did over there so yeah no I, I'd love to do that I'm such a geek <laughs> well if you get a contract I want I want two percent <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Um, while we were chatting everyone was sending in questions I do like uh, questions at the end so I'm just going to go into the question box and just see what um, everyone is asking Um, let's just see Um, Emily has asked if you had to spend quarantine with five people dead or alive who are you choosing? oh my goodness Uh, this is a great question Um, are they going to be boxers? no it can be anyone okay Um, so I'd really like to uh, I think Anthony Joshua, definitely. I'd love to meet, um, oh, I think, uh, Brian Cohen. He's up there. Um, and uh, Arturo Gatti. Oh, my um, fave. Yeah, I know. Absolute fave. Um, let me see. Ellie Scottney, absolutely. Uh, and my coach, Noel Callan. Yeah, that's a good combo. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good combo. Um Derek has asked, um, what are you doing in quarantine apart from training to keep busy? So um, I'm actually using this time quite productively to um, build myself a website because I think it's really important uh, for the rest of the stuff that I do, like my music and my talks and stuff. It's great to have people a way that people can access that information as well as my boxing information. So I'm busy doing that. I've set up um, a team ranking T-shirt that's coming through from Susie Wong's watch out for that um and actually i'm doing quite a lot of online classes for people for uh for mob group and for the box mind so people can stay fit um and i'm working with a charity called ad action who deals with people who are suffering from addiction problems and i'm uh, doing classes for them to help them keep active at this time so yeah keep myself busy you're really busy that's the most impressive one of of, of, of (laughs) <laughs> so this question's gotten asked relatively kind of near enough the last couple of weeks and yeah. uh, you're definitely doing the most <laughs> oh, I, let's, I let's go back still. in and have one <laughs> <laughs> um let's have a little look and just see if we get one more here um oh shane shane is a good question he's asked who's been the hardest hitter that you've ever been in a ring with Ooh. um for spite for, for fights or for sparring? Do, let's do both, just in case. So we'll take fighting and we'll take sparring. Okay. Um, actually, for sparring, probably it was when I was sparring Rakeem Noble. He, he hits hard. <laughs> like, he hits hard. Definitely. Um, and for his weight, he definitely hits hard. Um, uh, for fights, I think probably... Ooh. Let me think. Uh... I think, oh, uh, Carissa was up there, but maybe, um, actually, uh, yeah, Alicia, she hits pretty hard. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Alicia Napoleon. But, um, yeah, no, we've had some great sparring wars as well. So I think <laughs> it will, equals itself out. <laughs> I trust, I trust your judgment, Anis. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's, there's a couple just after shooting in here, so just, uh, I'll just ask them really quickly. Um, uh, Letha Lily May has asked, would you rematch Clar- Clarissa Shields? And if so, what would you do different? So Clarissa and I are really good mates now. Uh, we have the same uh, promoter, the same manager. We train together a lot and we spar together a lot. So um, at the moment, there is no plans to rematch Clarissa. I mean, if we were both paid loads and loads of money in the future, absolutely, you know. Um, and I think it, it would be a completely different fight to the first fight because I've only just advanced as a, as a boxer. So I, I can't tell you what I do differently, but I think at the moment uh, there's nothing in the, in the pipeline. But why not if there's money there for it? <laughs> We'll take the money if it's on the table. Right, final Absolutely. question. Um, Anya369 has asked, have you taught or done something in terms of promoting boxing for kids? By the way, love your classes at Gym Box. 
Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, no, so I, I work with a charity called Active Communities Network. And actually, I'm going to be doing a guest appearance that they're, they're running classes for their sort of uh, two groups of uh, age groups of kids. So from the younger ones and the older ones. So, yeah, I'm going to be doing some classes with them. And uh, when Clarissa was over here and she ran her camp for people, I helped out with that as well. So we had quite a few kids there. I love Amazing. teaching kids. So it's always it's always fun. <laughs> 100% agree. Um, Hannah, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been great. I really enjoyed that. Really great to get you on and um, really looking forward to um, hopefully seeing you at a world title again. Absolutely. That's the goal this year. And I don't care if coronavirus has happened just now. It's just to put it on hold for a little bit. But the focus is I know. the same. <laughs> We're all, I'm like, I, I, if I, I, I want a year back of my life. I'm not, next birthday, I'm not saying I'm an e, a year older. I'm going back a year. I'm taking this Absolutely. year back. Absolutely. <laughs> We've not even got anywhere near that. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, great to see you. And hopefully the next time that we see each other, it'll be at a show and it'll be um, for a post-fight interview with a world Absolutely. title. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you so much. Take Thanks care. Thanks so much, Hannah. See you soon. See bye. You. Bye-bye. Bye. bye.